I want to hand over uh, uh, the, the, the session to Dr. Waswa, who has been a tremendous member of the National Self Motherhood Executive uh, and Expert Committee. This is a committee which, uh, which is trying to streamline most of the things in uh, National Self Motherhood uh, uh, in, the, in the country and it's under Ministry of Health. We hope that this session will be quite fruitful. Dr. Waswa, uh, you can take over as our, as our moderator. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ladu. I'm wondering if we couldn't run the, the questionnaire first before we continue with the program while uh, going through the, pro, the introductions and definitions. Why don't we run the, the pre-meeting pre questionnaire? and give it like a three to five minutes, three minutes, because there are just a few questions. Maybe like two minutes should be enough. Okay? Then we'll do it again at the end. Thank you. Can we see Do, that? do let me, Dr. Richard, are we able to run it now? Or we had organized only for the session to be run once? Dr. Richard doesn't seem to be connecting with us. So in, initially, we had, we, had, we had planned to run it at the end of the session because we thought we didn't have much time. Yeah, so I think unless Richard has something to change about that, uh, okay. we may, yes. Okay, let's just uh, go on. I um, want to welcome all those who are logged on for this webinar on preeclampsia. Uh, this is one of the efforts of the National Safe Motherhood Committee to try to improve quality of care for mothers, maternal and newborn care in the country. I hope the Minister of Array has arranged actually for CPD points for this webinar, I hope. Uh, if they have not, we'll just take down the emails of the persons and their registrations and pass them on to the Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Council. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is of for pregnancy complicated, a common complication in pregnancy, and they cause us a lot of problems. Eh? Uh, mobility and mortality, both for the mother and for the child. And uh, the problem is that they are now becoming more frequent. Is it because uh, we are having a, uh, actually getting more, or is it better diagnosis? And then the question is, why are they getting more frequent? Is it a modern way of living? Lifestyle, maybe we shall need a research about this. But uh, of course, as we know, hypertensive disease of pregnancy contribute to a lot of maternal and perinatal death and mobility in Uganda. Up to about 3.7% of all pregnancies are complicated by preeclampsia. Uh, typically, the classical hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are divided into five categories. We have gestational hypertension, in which you have raised blood, raised blood pressure, which is transient, usually there's no proteinuria. And uh, this hypertension resolves normally by the end of 12 weeks of pregnancy, postpartum, and uh, usually there are no sequelae. And this diagnosis is usually a retrospective diagnosis, where the mother has delivered, it's going to the postnatal clinic, and the baby is a mother and, her, and the child are happy, and then you find there's no hypertension. Then you say this is gestational hypertension. The second category is a preeclampsia. Now, we all are aware of this problem. Preeclampsia has been sung up and down all, the, all around. And this is a pregnancy syndrome. It's a condition specific to pregnancy, and it affects most of the body systems and says, when you find raised blood pressure after 20 weeks of pregnancy, and uh, you find the blood pressure has raised by about 40, about 40 systolic and 90 diastolic, or a 30 millimeter raise in the systolic blood pressure, or a 15 millimeter rise in the diastolic blood pressure over and above the baseline blood pressure of the mother before pregnancy or in early pregnancy. And of course, there will be proteinuria. Um, there is something that is also known as non-proteinuric preeclampsia, which we must be 
very, very, very aware of is causing about to 5 to 10 percent of all pregnancies. And this is something that we should keep in mind. If you find a mother with high blood pressure and there's no proteinuria, remember there may be non proteinuric preeclampsia. Then, of course, the third one is eclampsia. This is when uh, the occurrence of convulsions a pregnant woman with or without eclampsia. So a pregnant woman who convulses is eclampsia until proved otherwise. Okay, and uh, as long as these convulsions are not attributable to any other cause, it is eclampsia. And then the fifth category is the chronic hypertension in pregnancy. This is the a mother who has had high blood, high, high blood pressure and uh, she gets pregnant, or oh, the, the high blood pressure is detected for the first time in pregnancy, in early pregnancy before 20 weeks of gestation. And then, of course, if this mother has <laughs> preeclampsia, and then after, six, after 12 weeks, she still remains hypertensive, then we say probably she had a pre existing hypertension. And uh, no, no, Dr. Wasuba, yes, are the slides moving or no, 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 this no. Is just the introduction? This is just oh, okay, the introduction and the definition. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, All right, uh, during the management, we shall also find a way of uh, predicting how we can predict hypertension, persistent hypertension later on in pregnancy. And then, of course, the last one is preeclampsia spine imposed on the mother was had. Hypertension. These are things that we, these are some of the acceptable categories of, pre of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. I would like now just, I would like now to deep dive into hypertensive disorders of pregnancy by asking uh, Dr. Mark Rugove to give us a case study on preeclampsia in Mbarara Regional Referral Hospital, what we have been what we have seen. And Dr. Ogobe is a specialist in Barra General Far Hospital with a special interest in this condition, hypertensive diseases, pregnancy. Dr. Rogobe. Thank you, Dr. Waspa. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to share some of the findings from the work we've done on preeclampsia, looking at uh, the risks for adverse perinatal and maternal outcomes among our patients. Mbara Regional Referral Hospital. By way of introduction, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are common. They complicate about 2 to 8% of all pregnancies. And the incidence of preeclampsia is seen to be seven times more in developing countries than developed countries. Um, also to note is that these disorders in pregnancy are associated with um, maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. And this is also worse in resource limited settings. And in our hospital, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are currently the second lead leading cause of maternal deaths. So the aim of our study was to de determine the risk factors for adverse maternal and, and perinatal outcomes among mothers with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. What you're seeing now is uh, our documented causes of maternal death. The leading cause of death is hemorrhage at 31%, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are second at 22%, and hence this makes this very important for us to learn and also see how we can avert some of these outcomes. Our study was a prospective court study um, running for about 11 months. It was at Mara General Far Hospital. And we looked at 103 pregnant women with hypertension at starting 12 weeks and above of gestation. And we excluded mothers who had a known history of hypertension prior to pregnancy. And we defined our hypertension as a blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 out of 90 millimeters of mercury. Our study variables were taken um, on the social demographic characteristics, the medical factors, and the obstetric 
history of the mothers. The outcome variables, the adverse perinatal outcome was any one of the following, a stillbirth, uh, admission to neonatal uh, care unit, or a neonatal death uh, by discharge. And the adverse maternal outcomes were hysterectomy, a repeat laparotomy, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, ICU admission, health syndrome, and blood transfusion. In the analysis, we describe the participant characteristics using frequency tables and also calculated the adjusted risk ratios to determine the independent factors uh, for this adverse outcome. And the p-value less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. So as we all see, most of our patients were, our participants were um, less than 35 years. They were married, they had been referred, and they were mouth gravid. Important to note, to your right, you would see that most of the participants uh, admitted actually had preeclampsia with severe symptoms. That's about 71% of the cohort, and 21% of the cohort had eclampsia. So if you added that to over 90% of the participants had severe disease. Um, in this important, importantly, we looked at how the administration of magnesium sulfate was, and only 44% of the mothers received a complete dose, and that means about 56% uh, of the mothers either did not receive or received a complete dose. And that is important for us to note. The documented uh, adverse outcomes, if you look at the perinatal outcomes, they were very common. Over half of our participants reported an adverse perinatal outcome. That's about 58% of all our mothers. And uh, common was uh, admission to neonatal intensive care unit, followed by stillbirth. So um, really a problem for mothers. And then the maternal outcomes, the common one was uh, blood transfusion, postpartum hemorrhage, top uh, syndrome, and admission to ICU. When we look at the factors predicting uh, the adverse perinatal outcomes, we had two factors. One was a gestational age of less than 34 weeks, uh, increased the risk of adverse perinatal outcomes, while a birth weight of less than 2.5 also increased the risk of uh, adverse perinatal outcomes. There was no difference um, seen in people who had received steroids or those who, who hadn't and neither was there a difference in those, among those who had received magnesium sulfate. Um, for the maternal outcomes, we note that mothers who are referred from other health centers are over 3.9 times risk of an adverse maternal outcome, as well as the mother who has a convulsion, so mothers with eclampsia. And this is important for us to note. But, um, as we conclude, from our study, we note that majority of the women who had uh, uh, had preeclampsia with severe symptoms or eclampsia, there was an unacceptably high rate of adverse perinatal and maternal outcomes with about a fifth of all mothers uh, experiencing a stillbirth. This is about 20%, and it's catastrophic for the mother and uh, something for us to think about. And therefore, we need to um, improve continental surveillance for women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and in particular, improve neonatal and maternal critical care expertise at all our units. 
And uh, thinking about referral it would be important to have early detection and referral. And we also think that probably the pre-referring units can uh, take some bit of action, give the loading dose of magnesium sulfate, give a start dose of the antihypertensive prior to referral, which might cause uh, improvement in the patient. So we think uh, some of these um, interventions can help. Just to say that the work we presented has been published in peer reviewed journals, and uh, it was part of a research fellowship under Fogarty and under uh, the MAST uh, Barra University Research Training Institute and uh, Office of Research Administration. And I want to thank uh, my mentors and the whole team and the department at MAST. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mark Rukove, for that presentation. That's a picture of what was happening with as far as preeclampsia and eclampsia is in Mbara Regional Far Hospital, the outcomes and the type of mothers and the, the fetal outcomes. One of the recommendations from uh, this operative operational research was uh, to improve antenatal care. And uh, with us here we have a sister Bakashaba Ana, who is a uh, nursing officer in the antenatal clinic, MCH clinic, who is going to take us through antenatal screening for hypertensive disorders in pregnancy as a, as a step towards to improve antenatal detection and management of these mothers with preeclampsia. Dr. Was, yes. Dr. Waswa, there yes. is a hand up by, by Nonori Emmanuel. I don't know if you want to take it now or we could take it at the end of sister's presentation. I, I thought we'd rather, people would rather uh, have, write down their questions and we'll put them at the end okay. so that we have a more okay. time to discuss and interact. Wonderful. One. I think Nonori, Nonori can actually put the question in the that. chat, then we can discuss it at the end. So Sister right. Bakashaba is uh, one of our senior nursing officers and uh, she's one of those in charge of the MCH clinic family planning. And she gracefully agreed to take us through antenatal screening for hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Sister Bakashev. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Waka. Thank you, Dr. Uh, OK, my task is now to, you know, as the saying goes, that uh, prevention is better than cure. We know that like, this uh, hypertensive disorders may not be prevented, but at least if we, we screen early and identify the complications, when you identify these complications early now, it can, uh, you can avoid severe disease or severe complications. So, so now let's go through how to the antenatal care we provide, what we look out, uh, out for to prevent these complications from findings. So uh, first I will uh, define what antenatal care means. Antenatal care can be defined as the care provided by a skilled healthcare professionals to pregnant women and adolescent girls in order to ensure the best health conditions for both mother and baby during pregnancy. So the role of a midwife in the management of preeclampsia. Generally, a midwife is the first is the first contact to a pregnant mother. She reports and you are the one who takes her through the pregnancy. So you are in best in the better position to follow this mother and avoid this. On, on the first contact, a midwife conducts a comprehensive assessment for early detection and management of complications that can affect the mother, the baby, or the mother. The mother is assessed from head to toe. As you do this, you, so you will rule out some danger signs and refer in time. The midwife asks about, this is the history now, 
you have to take a careful history of the mother if you are to avoid these problems. Extremes of maternal age. You ask about the age. Uh, for example, if a mother is uh, above 35 years is at risk, and a very young mother, a young primary gravida is also at risk. So that mother is really should be monitored closely. Gestation age, uh, also if the pregnancy is up to 20, 20 weeks and above, then you suspect this. In case you find the high, high blood pressure, then you suspect preeclampsia automatically. Whether it is the first pregnancy, of course, the first pregnancy is uh, th those mothers who get these problems are especially they are first they are prime gravidas. Uh, first pregnancy with current partner, then there is pre previous history of hypertension in pregnancy because of most of these conditions we have car. So you have to also to be on lookout for that. Then family history of hypertension. In case you have mother or sisters or close relatives have the problem, so also you have to put it in mind that is also likely to help them. Is the mother hypertensive, diabetic, or has renal disease? This also is a predisposing factor to preeclampsia. Is it twin pregnancy or in vitro fertilization? These are artificial fertilization of course in interpregnancy interval if the pregnancy is less than two years or above 10 years eh? that one is also <laughs> examination eh? you have as i have said that you have to examine the woman from head to toe you take the weight this weight is taken or at, or on the first visit or when you first interface with the mother and it should be monitored to see whether she's gaining excessive weight or it's a normal. Because when you take it once and you, you, you have to start in order to BMI. This blood pressure is very important. And Sorry, let's continue. Yeah, so this, this blood pressure you have, as Dr. Waswa was saying, that when there is a raise of diastolic from the zip from 15 baseline, eh, from 15, if it's the mother now it's exceeded her no more. Her normal diastolic pressure raises by 15 millimeters of mercury. Because you cannot detect this unless you compare from the previous, you found with subsequent recordings. So, Odima, hmm, you have also, is also an indicator in obstetric exam, like routine, intrauterine growth restriction. This also, when you find the height of pharmacies much lower than the gestational age. You also suspect intrauterine growth retardation, and in such a case, it, the cause may be hypertensive or disorders. And hydromina is also a predisposing factor to hypertension to preeclampsia. That was then evaluation. Hmm? Labs, lab investigations. Urinalysis is a must to diagnose preeclampsia. If you find you found protein in urine, the, as a midwife, the, the first suspect uh, minus urinary tract infection, the, the, the first, suspect, first suspicion is of preeclampsia. And then random blood sugar, when you found a diabetic mother, this is also a predisposing factor. That mother has to be monitored closely. And then, 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 then this other examination or investigation is a routine, but the first ones are the most important to diagnose uh, uh, preeclampsia. The blood group, that was, uh, those are routine hemoglobin level, uh, uh, RCT, syphilis test, um, malaria, RDT for malaria, especially for uh, prime gravidas, 
and hepatitis B. These are normal routine investigations we do on pregnant women. Then obstetric ultrasound. This one is also important because it will tell you the number of feature, as we know, that the multiple pregnancy predisposes to pregnancy. Yeah? And uh, the, you also can tell the size of the egg throughout in the uterine growth rate restriction and amount of amniotic fruit to which in this case is polyhydromerase. If the amniotic fluid index is high, then this can cause the mother to preeclampsia. Then in um, in order to avoid this, as Dr. Waswa said, that is the second leading cause of maternal death in our hospital, and I think in Uganda. So we have to be prepared for this for it. We have emergency trait in our setting in MCH, which co contains all these things, magnesium sulfate, hydralazin, nephidipine, methylodopa, lignocaine, uh, calcium gluconate, which is an antidote to, to magnesium. Then syringe, to 20 and 10 mil syringes, IV normal saline, giving sets, cameras, strapping, and gloves. So this tray is there in case of any, uh, any emergency, we are in the right position and we have obstetrician to help us to manage such a case. The, the health education, of course, as I told you, really we, information about danger signs. These mothers need to know the danger signs so that they report early in the, in the, in the hospital. Or when they, they get them, they rush very fast. So we give her education about danger signs, and even they are displayed in Antinento in a vernacular, in English, both in English and vernacular. So every mother who attends to read, and also we also tell them about the word, and we also emphasize on attending Antinento, start attending Antinento early, because as we have seen the blood pressure, when you report the first blood pressure early, you can, you can be able to what to monitor that blood pressure and whether there is an increase or weight, maternal weight to see. But when she, he reports like at 30 weeks, so you may not now know the trend. And this one is not good. So we encourage mothers to attend and to add enough so that we monitor them well. Danger signs include headache. These are the danger signs we tell them about. Headache, swelling of the legs, a, a gastric pain, bad vision and conversion. So they are aware. So we tell them, when you see this, please report Ari to the hospital. <laughs> Thank you very much. I urge all midwives to really provide a, a, a high standard antenatal care to avoid these problems. Because I, I told you in the beginning that we can't prevent them, but when we detect them early enough, we can avoid uh, this thing to be severe, to go into severe disease and be and develop complications. Thank you so much, all the listeners. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sister Bakashaba, for that uh, presentation and uh, you know, taking us through what we should look out to be able the quite a care which we should use to be able to detect these mothers early. Um, the definition was very, very clear. It's a planned program of education, monitoring, treatment, prevention, planning to make pregnancy and delivery a satisfactory experience for both the baby, the mother, and the community. And the community, we mean, the, we mean including the husband. Edu health education is a very important aspect, and the, the issue of the danger signs that they have detected early is very important as the nursing officer has said. Now, when the nursing officer detects or suspects a preeclampsia, what do you do? We need to make the definitive diagnosis. And uh, Dr. T.B. Juka Levan is going to take us through how making a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Dr. T.B. Juka is an obstetrician gynecologist, a homegrown person specialist right from Marara Regional Referral Hospital. I give you Dr. Tibishka. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasa. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone attending the webinar. Uh, in relation to diagnosis, uh, partly additional to what my uh, colleagues have said, um, first we start with the criteria for the hypertension, and typically the hypertension is a systolic but blood pressure of uh, equal or more than one ten millimeters of mercury, or a diastolic of uh, diastolic blood pressure of more than ninety millimeters of mercury. But it can severe hypertension where we have a blood pressure of more than 160 and all diastolic of more than uh, 110 millimeters of mercury. And in case of chronic hypertension, of course, the hypertension preceding the pregnancy or presenting at least uh, two occasions before 20 weeks uh, of gestation and all persists uh, beyond 12 weeks of uh, postpartum. Uh, in relation to the commonness uh, presentation, which is the preeclampsia, uh, I, I think I'll tell you about the clinical features and probably the diagnosis. Uh, one of the features being the hypertension, uh, and we are talking about uh, systolic blood pressure of more than 140 millimeters of mercury and the diastolic blood pressure of more than 90 millimeters on at least two occasions, at least four hours apart, and of course, presenting more than 20. Uh, or equal 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normal tensive woman. And, and in some cases, you may get uh, systolic blood pressures of more than 160, and uh, or diastolic blood pressures of more than uh, 110. Uh, of course, there you need to uh, repeat over a short while. You don't have to wait for the four hours, so you can probably have to control these blood pressures. Of the other common clinical features, I uh, would talk about the severe persistent epigastric pain or right upper quadrant pain, some presentation may be erythrosternal pain. This is one of the cardinal symptoms of severe disease. Uh, patients will typically tell you about a radiation of this pain to the back. It may be associated with nausea and vomiting. Uh, sometimes uh, palpating the abdomen, you will notice uh, uh, tenderness of the liver. And of course, this is typically because of uh, uh, the stretch in the glisson capsule. Uh, typically, you may think of it uh, in relation to uh, uh, hemorrhage or the inflammatory reactions that are already occurring in relation to this disease. In severe cases, you will notice um, a liver rupture or uh, the hemorrhage. And you notice the patient will have this a sudden onset of the right upper quadrant pain may be associated with rapid decrease in the blood pressures of the patient. And that would be important for you to, I think, and uh, have a, a better sort of the uh, severe issue of uh, preeclampsia. The neurological presentations are typically patients with presented symptoms of uh, a new onset and extreme persistent severe headache. Uh, they may describe it as a, a worse headache they felt uh, ever before. And this may be a temporal, frontal, occipital, or a diffuse headache in some of these patients. It may be throbbing, uh, pounding, or piercing. And of course, the main cause of this is uh, the different uh, inflammatory changes occurring in the brain. Talk about uh, the sequelae of the cerebral edema, the ischemic changes, and of course, uh, the generalized endothelial cell dysfunction and the macrospasms, and this gives you a high index of suspicion and probably if it is too much, you need to actually consult a neurologist and probably uh, go on to do uh, investigations uh, like a CT scan to be able to uh, find out what may be happening. The other uh, typical presentation may be the visual disturbances uh, like blurring of vision, uh, flashing lights, sparks, cotomata, patient is only able to see a little bit uh, of, of, of uh, different objects, uh, diplopia. Some may present with cortical blindness, especially when they are uh, retinal hemorrhages, uh, detachments, and also the spasms. This whole visual uh, disturbances are explained by the uh, spasms in the retinal uh, blood supply, uh, the cerebral autoregulation, and sometimes the cerebral edema. And in some cases, we may have the, the seizures. Of course, that changes, uh, gives you a diagnosis of the eclampsia. This has been noted in one in, uh, one, uh, in 50 women, especially those with severe features. 
and one in 400, uh, 400 women, those without uh, severe features. Of course, this patient will have grand mal seizures uh, in absence of other neurological diseases. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is because of uh, the vasospasm, yeah, the reproid and sometimes the hemorrhage and the skin. So you may need to uh, do further than just the uh, radiology to find out what is happening. Uh, in some cases, we may have hyperreflexia, uh, where we have a sustained ankle clonus. And other uh, worst cases, we have strokes, and this will typically be uh, hemorrhagic strokes, uh, which will precede a severe headache and, uh, of course, fluctuation of the blood pressures. Uh, furthermore, the clinical features, patients will present with pulmonary edema, and of course, this will have uh, this near chest pain, and this SPO2s will be uh, going below 93%. And in that case, we think of different uh, causes of the edema. Uh, typically, we think of the pulmonary vascular hydrostatic pressures it rising, and of course, because they are losing the protein and leaking uh, because of the impaired barriers in the, uh, the kidneys, we definitely have reduced oncotic pressure uh, in these patients. Some will present with oliguria, which will typically be transient, and we'll notice uh, less than 100 mils of uh, uh, urine over four hours. And in severe cases, uh, less than 500 mils in 24 hours. And of course, this is due to the uh, a fall in the GFR uh, uh, because of uh, the altered uh, uh, part of the altered uh, vasculature in the in the kidneys, but also the vasospasms, contraction in the intravascular space. Of course, this leading to uh, the sodium and water retention. Some cases, patients will present with abrupt placenta, and in patients without uh, severe symptoms, it may happen in one percent of those patients. And those with severe symptoms up to 3%, uh, you should raise, should raise your index of suspicion when you see a patient with a brush of placenta and you don't probably know what the cause may be. May, maybe they start for you to think about uh, uh, placenta previa. Uh, going to the potential lab uh, findings, Sister Bakashawa has told us about some of the tests that you may do. They may be the same tests you may have to go on and do even at the time of uh, further evaluation of this patient. But typically, we talk about uh, the proteinuria. As much as in our setting, we are mostly actually using the urine dipstick uh, uh, protein, where we, when we find a urine dipstick of two, uh, at least two plus uh, in a clean voided midstream urine, that's uh, enough to think about uh, 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 preeclampsia, or we'll, uh, talk about the uh, proteinuria. Uh, however, uh, different literature uh, thinks that uh, this is a, quali a qualitative study, I mean a qualitative test. If you're able to do uh, a 24-hour urine collection, then you should be able to estimate at least the 300 milligrams of the protein. Or you may do a random urine protein to create an ratio uh, and may, uh, should be able to find a 0 0.3 milligram protein uh, to uh, milligram protein in, in a random sample uh, specimen. And of course, the reasons for the proteinuria, of course, we think it, it is some transient uh, process and this progresses as the disease progresses. And of course, it's because of the impaired integrity of uh, uh, the glomerular filtration barrier. And uh, of course, uh, leading because of the non-selective act uh, activity on the um, filtration barrier, then there will be leakage of the protein, which we shall, we shall see. Uh, other potential lab findings is the elevation in the creatinine uh, to more than 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. And this is a sign of severe disease. Uh, some literature talks about doubling of patients uh, baseline creating in absence of adrenal uh, disease uh, and uh, of course it's due to a fall in the GFR. Other typical presentation is uh, a thrombocytopenia. Uh, in 20% of patients with preeclampsia, we shall have a less, I mean, reduction of platelets less than 150,000 microliters. And in severe disease, the platelet count reduces even to less than 100,000 microliters. 
we may also have uh, elevated transaminases. Uh, typically in severe disease, we talk about uh, elevation two times to the upper limit, uh, going to up to uh, 70, 80 or more. Uh, we may also have hemolysis, and you can note the hemolysis uh, through a peripheral smear where we uh, notice uh, schistocytes and helmet cells. But when we go on to do a serum uh, lactate dehydrogenase, which will typically be raised to more than uh, 600 uh, units per liter. Uh, also, we may do, we may find an elevated uh, indirect bilirubin level uh, to, um, beyond uh, 1.2 uh, milligrams uh, per liter. Uh, in the same, uh, we need to go on and really do evaluation for the baby because we are thinking about the mother and the baby, and this should be done concurrently as we are uh, evaluating the mother. Uh, sister talked about uh, uh, the ultrasound sonography. We may do a biophysical profile, a non-stress test, uh, depending on uh, the gestation age that this patient is presenting. Our sonography, we're aiming to look at the amniotic fluid and uh, estimate the weight of this uh, baby. And of course, um, we anticipate there may be fetal growth restriction, which may be accompanied by the oligohydramnios uh, because of the uh, fetal sparing uh, situation happening in this baby uh, and uh, most of uh, uh, the, the, the body resources being saved for the brain. Uh, we may go on and do uterine and umbilical artery dopplers. And of course, we expect uh, elevation in the fertility indices. Uh, these may not be very sensitive or specific for preeclampsia because they can uh, happen in other uh, conditions that may lead uh, to some sort of uh, placental insufficiencies. Uh, but uh, on these Dopplers, when you find uh, alterations, absent or reverse diastolic flaws in the uh, umbilical artery Dopplers, this may mean that this baby is at much risk and increased risk of uh, uh, adverse outcomes, and that may need uh, you to act a little uh, much better uh, to help uh, help this baby. Other presentations as uh, may include the <laughs> HELP syndrome, where we have hemolysis, uh, elevation of the liver enzymes, and uh, reduction in the platelets. This is one of the severe features uh, of um, uh, well, a, a, a variant of preeclampsia with severe features. And of course, um, these may occur with or without hypertension. And in uh, 82 to 88 percent, we have hypertension and um, proteinuria in 86 to 100 percent, or uh, dysfunction in the CNS uh, uh, function. We may also have gestational hypertension. Now we have hypertension without proteinuria, and no signs of uh, preeclampsia related end organ dysfunction happening after 20 weeks of gestation. This typically resolves after 20, uh, 12 weeks postpartum. However, as uh, some of these patients may actually progress to eventually have protein or have uh, severe symptoms, symptoms or uh, laboratory findings. And when that happens, definitely these patients need to be managed as preeclampsia. We also talk about a presentation with uh, preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. This is in women with pre-existing chronic hypertension. Uh, they suddenly get worsening or resistant hypertension, and this is usually acute. And we may have a new onset or a sudden rise in uh, proteinuria. Uh, in these same patients, there may be a significant new end organ dysfunction, typically after 20 weeks, or some of these symptoms may actually happen after the uh, postpartum, after the mother has delivered then you have a uh, worsening of uh, the end organ uh, dysfunction. I think uh, precisely that's what I have to give. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tibijuka, for that presentation. As we can see, there are so many ways that, uh, so many requirements to make the diagnosis, but it is important to have a high index of suspicion and the laboratory workup. Ladies and gentlemen, we have in-house the head of department 
of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Mara General Referral Hospital, Mara of Science and Technology, Dr. Kayono Musa. Dr. Kayono Musa, you're most welcome to our webinar for blessing us by your presence. Um, ladies and gentlemen, preeclampsia is a disease of theories and uh, thoughts and uh, we sometimes a difficult thing to handle. We have with us Professor Yarini, who is a specialist in phytomaternal medicine, special interest in these conditions, who has been uh, one of our hallmarks in uh, handling these, uh, these conditions in our department. And Professor Yarini is going to take us through the management of preeclampsia as he sees it best. Please welcome Dr. Yarini. Thank you, Dr. Waswa. Good afternoon, everyone. So I totally agree with, we are handling today a very hard topic with high morbidity and mortality, especially because the morbidity and mortality is high not only for the mother, it's also for the baby and a child. So in the management of preeclampsia, I would like to start saying that it's important to recognize that the prophylaxis of preeclampsia is important on the way that we may be will prevent complications of preeclampsia is we are able to identify a high risk patients to develop the disease. So we are recommended from 14 weeks of pregnancy, the use of 65 milligram of aspirin. From the study done for Bellison in 1980s, the lack of supplement of calcium was close associated to high prevalence of preeclampsia. So currently we use the combination of aspirin and supplement of calcium as a prophylaxis of preeclampsia. That is two important things that we have to know. Let's go for goal of management of preeclampsia. Usually you see that the majority of the pediatricians say we have three goals to achieve. They say control of hypertension, prevention of convulsion, delivery of placenta in the safest and quickest means. However, we would like to add another important goal to achieve in the management of preeclampsia. So we like to say that we have two goals to achieve. The control of the hypertension, the prevention of the convulsion, the delivery of the placenta, but the four goals to achieve also is the postpartum recovery of the patients because the majority of obstetricians think that the problem is over as soon as you terminate the pregnant and it is a big mistake. 20% of the patient with preeclampsia will persist with hypertension in the postpartum period. Even we can say it for our own study that 27% of the patients could maybe stay as a, high, a chronic hypertension patients even they never recover the BP normal after the delivery. So it is the reason we insist, and we have been teaching for the last 10 years, that goal to achieve are not only three. We have to say that we have four goals to achieve. Control of the hypertension. For our experience and the majority of meta-analysis we have studied, the first line antipertensive to be using during crisis are Trandate, what is la for everyone, hydralazine and infedipine. In no crisis hypertension, I would like to say, and it is important to remark, the drug to be chosen depends on the spare knowledge about the drug that the clinician has. There is no drug superior to another one. And for the last point, it is very important also to say, in breastfeeding, the majority of the antihypertensive drugs are considered to have a wide margin of safety. So for acute therapy, in severe hypertension, what is more than 160 millimeter of mercury, systole and 110, over 110 of diastole. The goal is to keep the diastole pressure between 90 and 100 millimeter of mercury to prevent the cerebral hemorrhage. The alternative of antipertensive drug for acute therapy, we go for hydralazine, labetalol, and nifedipine. In our setting here in Uganda, the majority of the public hospital, they are using hydralazine, hydralazine as the first line, and nifedipine. However, we insist all are safe, all are important, all can save life, but let's go step by step to say that, for example, la betalo has the good advantage that reduce the side effect in the patients. So usually the use of la betalo is 100 milligram in 20 milliliter, but we will say that the best way to use the la betalo is 
using 100 milligram in 100 milliliter of normosaline, like you have one milligram every one milliliter of normosaline. Usually we start with 20 milligram, but we recommend it that 20 milligram could be useful for a person that is using that medication without deeply knowledge. But obstetricians have to know that labetalol has to be using 0.25 milligrams per kg. Why? A patient of 60 kilos need at least 50 milligrams of labetalol in the first two minutes, not 20. A patient of 80 kilos could use 20 milligrams. However, a patient who has 90 kilos, 100 kilos, maybe need 22 or 25 milligrams of labetalol at the first time. So let's say 20 could be usually important, but the calculation using the way of the patient is important. We can increase the doses depending for is the patient need more to control the BP, we increase to 40 and 80. What is important to know is that we cannot pass of 300 milligrams in 24 hours. So before we go to the prevention, in hydralazine, it's important that everyone know that there are two presentations. The one more common to use in Uganda is 20 milligrams, but we have, for example, in Cuba, the presentation of 25 milligrams. But if we are using in Uganda 20 milligrams, we have the dilution in 10 milliliters of normosaline. So we have five milligrams every 2.5 milliliter of normosaline. You know that we have to use five milligrams in the first minute, so we can wait until 20 minutes to repeat the second doses. It is important to know. In effect, we insist that it's important and could be very useful, but we cannot forget the interaction between, between the nifedipine and the magnesium sulfate. So be careful because in majority of the cases with preeclampsia, we have to use the magnesium sulfate to prevent the feet. So we, we are, when we are combining it, the nifedipine and magnesium sulfate, we can potentially for that issue. So we have to be careful with that. But if you don't have hydralazine, if you don't have a beta load, and the BP is more than 110 of diastole, risk and benefits, use nifedipine, but don't pass of 60 milligram in 24 hours. Prevention of the convulsions. The majority of the people say we have to prevent using the preacher methods. And I totally agree that in low resources setting, for the lack of human resources, we can be using the preacher method as the more common method. But we have to know that there are four ways to administer magnesium sulfate for a patient. We call the pitcher, we call the suspan, we call CBI, and the modified suspan, what is totally IB. But here in our setting, we use usually the preacher method, what every know is four gram IB of 20% of magnesium sulfate in five minutes, and secondary five grams of 50% of magnesium sulfate each bottle. And after that, we have to handle and maintain doses of five grams intramuscular with lidocaine one or two percent every four hours for the next 24 hours. Or I would like to say also for the 24 hours after the last convulsion of the patient, because sometimes we need to use in 24 hours after the last convulsion is the patient has been convulsing during the method. So for the modified suspan, the advantage is that the method is totally IV. But the disadvantage is that you need a human resources permanently with the patient because that patient needs every one hour to use one or two grams of magnesium sulfate IV. We have to be careful with magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is very innocuous drugs. However, be careful. When we pass after 10 million equivalent of magnesemia, we have a complication. So we have to be careful and we have to say that three things we have to uh, take in consideration using the magnesium sulfate. The tendon reflex, the urine output, and the respiratory rate. And I insist when I teach my postgraduate student that the problem with the urine output is not because the magnesium sulfate is something that is damaged the kidney. The problem is that the excretion of the magnesium sulfate is totally through the kidney. So if the patient is getting anuria or oliguria, result of the complication of the preeclampsia, the magnesium sulfate will be excreted low concentration. So will increase the concentration of blood and the complication can come. Specifically, when we have more than 15 mil equivalent of magnesium sulfate at the magnesemia, be careful, cardiac arrest or respiratory uh, uh, arrest could happen. So it is important to know. 
So the third goal to achieve is the obstetric management. We totally agree that preeclampsia is a disease who has total dependence from the pregnancy. We have not seen a patient without pregnant with preeclampsia. We have not seen any of these complaints in a patient who is not a pregnant. So we know that the real treatment, the real cause of preeclampsia is the pregnant. So the real treatment of preeclampsia is the termination of the pregnant. But the question is, who will terminate the pregnant? Can do that for a midwife? We need a consultant in obstetric. When is going to be eliminated the pregnant? So it's important to know that the moment to terminate the pregnant is a decision that I would like to say should be in team. We have to be sure that the majority of the good outcome in obstetric are coming when we are teach when we are working as a team. So when we say the decision of terminate a pregnant for a preeclamptic mother, I would like to listen a second opinion. That decision cannot come for only one person. It is my first recommendation in the issue. Second point, I would like to say that the decision will take in consideration factors like the disease severity, the fetal maturity, the maternal and fetal condition, and the cervical status. And as a patient for more than 20 years of experience, I insist that the best way to terminate the pregnant in preeclampsia is using the vaginal delivery. It's a big mistake to think that if we go for a cesarean session, as soon as we have the diagnosis, we are putting the patient in a safe condition. Cesarean session has complications as own procedure. If we have this procedure together with preeclampsia, but the risk is increasing. So it is the reason we have the recommendation that to terminate preeclampsia, we have to make a balance. What is the risk and what is the benefit of the cesarean session and the vagina delivery? So the severity of this, the disease severity, we are clear that severe preeclamptic patients, specifically those one who are coming with epigastric, severe epigastric pain or premonitory sign of eclampsia, to continue the pregnancy in those cases is not safe. So it is important. Sometimes in my experience, I have seen people, even a pregnant patient, even with amaurosis, they have loss of visions. So be careful. Cases with that severity, we have to think that determination of pregnant has to be done as soon as possible, but in the safe environment, in the safe environment. When we talk about fetal maturity, I would like to say, for one obstetrician, it's very easy to handle preeclampsia after 27 weeks of pregnant because it's not a reason. Okay. It's not a reason to, to a patient who has more than 27 weeks of pregnant, but is at 10, to hold a severe preeclamptic patient. The problem is coming to the obstetrician when we have, for example, we have in our experience in Cuba that, that I would like to, 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 hand, to share with you that preeclampsia, to understand better, is easy to understand as we say early preeclampsia and late preeclampsia. It's not a routine we have in Uganda to handle no, before 24 at or after 34 weeks. It is a reason. It is a reason we are recommended, we are recommended that those cases pass the debut of preeclampsia before 34 weeks, what is the 20% of the total pregnant pain with preeclampsia has more risk, has more proportion of morbidity and mortality for mothers and fetus. So it is another reason that we say to handle preeclampsia, we have to be sure that early preeclampsia is close associated to a high intrauterine fetus death, a brooch of placenta, eclampsia and postpartum hemorrhage. Even we have seen more common the pulmonary, the amniotic emboli, amniotic fluid embolies in early preeclampsia than in late preeclampsia. So it is a reason we insist as obstetrician that when we have a preeclamptic patient, the first question we have to, to ask is, is this early preeclamptic case or is it a late preeclamptic case? For the fetal maturity, as soon as we know 
that the fetal is totally mature is not a reason to hold a patient with severe preeclampsia. But be careful. To say terminate the pregnant is not that we have to run immediately. We have between four and six hours to stable the patient before we go for the termination of the pregnancy. For the cervical statute, let's say this. It's now a new era. So the obstetrician, we have more advantage. We have now prostaglandin. We have now misoprostol. Before we see the b shot score is so poor, it's two, is four points. So let's go for CISA because the induction is going to get maybe 24 hours and it's not safe for the patient. That scenario has changed dramatically. Since we have prostaglandin, as soon as we have severe preeclampsia and the patient has all the conditions for vaginal delivery, as soon as we are handling the patient with antihypertensive drug, magnesium sulfate, all those things, we are recommended at the same time to allocate a 25 microgram of misoprostol vaginally. So we are preparing the service for the procedure that, that maybe we will go ahead. I will insist for everyone here, the best way to terminate the pregnant with preeclampsia is the more safe, the vaginal delivery. We agree that some specific cases maybe need a cesarean session, but be careful. Don't think that the cesarean session is the solution for all the patients with CP preeclampsia or even eclampsia. So, in 1982, West he were reported around 29 cases of jaundice, uh, hepatic enzyme elevated, thrombocytopenia, and hemolysis. From that time in 1982, after came Professor Sibai in the United States of America, who reporting at least more than 300 cases with the same condition. So we were able to identify that we have a serious problem between one or two percent of the patient with preeclampsia. That problem we call health syndromes. Why is a problem? Because it's very close associated to high morbidity and high mortality, not only for the mother, also for the fetus. So we have a clear criteria for a diagnosis of health syndrome. Those criteria, there are two. As obstetrician, I like to say we have two schools. Eh? We have Martin in Mississippi, and we have Sibai in Tennessee. But generally, worldwide, the people like to use more the Sibai school in Tennessee because they are using more the condition. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have LDH elevated beyond 600 international unit per liter. We have catalysts less than 100,000, and we have the uh, transaminates major, uh, beyond 70 international unit per liter. It's good that we agree that some people like to use the Martin School in Mississippi because Martin is able to divide the health syndrome depend, depend the platelet count in three groups, say group health syndrome, group one, group two, group three. However, we follow the school of CVI because it's more practical. So we say that any patient who has more than 600 international units per liter of LDH, that the transaminates are more than 70 international units and the platelet count is less than 100,000, we, we has a full health syndrome. And you may, maybe you could ask why he called full health syndromes. Ah, because currently many authors, they would like to say complete and incomplete health syndromes. So also for incomplete health syndrome, they are using the same criteria, but at least to be present to at least to be present too. And in our experience, what all we have to be present is the thrombocytopenia. So if we get a patient with health syndromes, so what we are recommended currently, you see, number one, I told you before, out, good outcome in obstetrician are coming when we handle the patient as a team. So a health syndrome patient is one patient that is requesting from the beginning a multidisciplinary team because we have there to be sure that maybe we need a gastroenterology 
to handle specifically the liver dysfunction. Maybe we need the hematology to handle specifically the thrombocytopenia. Because as obstetrician, we have knowledge of everything, but so. Hello. To be outside the intensive care unit. With the steroid, what is dexamethasone, betamethasone, or prednisone? Ah, it's okay. They say it's unstable, the connection. That with the steroid, what we insist is there are two schools. One school who like to use the steroid, and they are strong recommendedly the steroid, and one school that they don't see any advantage or any different outcomes when they use the steroid and when they don't use the steroid. In our experience, because we can read about many meta-analysis, but in 20 years, you reach your own experience. In my own experience, steroid has to be used, because always is going to be useful in the recovery of the plaque. I don't say that the nisolone is the best one. I don't say that the desametasone is the best one. You have to use the steroid in the species of you have. If you have desametasone, use desametasone. If you have prednisone, prednisolone, use prednisolone. If you have betametasone, use betametasone. What I have seen is that we can recover the placent the platelets in, in shorter times if we are able to use steroids. Blood product specific fresh plasma. Because many of those patients, they are getting serious DIC. So for those coagulopathies, we have to be sure that there are two important things. The fresh plasma, we have to handle also to put a transfusion of platelets. So it is going to be helpful. Plasmapheresis. We know that in low resources setting, sometimes it's very difficult to handle patients through plasmapheresis. But we have to know that it's very useful in some specific cases of health syndrome. However, plasmapheresy could be hard to use in low resources setting, but I am happy to see that in Embarara, we have now hemodialysis. So early hemodialysis is a very useful procedure, specifically in those patients with health syndrome that they got tubular acute tubular necrosis. We know that the majority of patients with health syndrome they have a real kidney damage, specifically could be cortical necrosis or a tubular necrosis. For those cases with tubular necrosis, let me tell you what we know. Don't wait days and days expecting that the patient will recover the renal function spontaneously. It is a big mistake. As soon as we realize that the patient is in anuria and has been more than 24 hours with a conservative management of the kidney functions, be sure that the early hemodialysis will be useful. The question is going to be always this. The majority of the patient with health syndrome in acute renal failure, they are very sick. That is true. And the nephrology is always challenges you asking this question. Do you think the patient will improve with hemodialysis because the hemodialysis as the own procedure is a high risk procedure? But we have to make a balance. What is the benefits of the early hemodialysis and what is the risk? In our experience, in acute renal failure, in health syndrome, or even in severe preeclampsia and eclampsia, don't waste time. Don't wait two, three days. Push for early hemodialysis and you will save patients. Vaginal delivery. Now, maybe people say in health syndrome, the patient is very safe if we are able to terminate the pregnant as soon as possible and we perform a cesarean session. And I'm going to replay that that is a big mistake. If you don't have the way to terminate the patient, the pregnant safely through a vaginal delivery, maybe we can think about cesarean session. But I will insist, the vaginal delivery is the more safe procedure to terminate the pregnant in preeclampsia, eclampsia, and all those conditions has complicated the patient. And maybe you say, why professor has put in 
liver transplant in the slide. Of course, maybe you are thinking with the mentality of in low resources setting how we will do, but we are we are today sharing our, our opinion and our experience for the last 20 years. And it's not a surprise that to save the life of a patient with health syndrome, we need to replace the liver and we need even to do a liver transplant. So it is important. But here I will concrete to say that if we are able to put the patient in ICU, we terminate the pregnancy safe, we use the steroid, we treat the complication with full blood, fresh plasma, and we are able to, repay, to, to, to treat the kidney complication in case that the, the tubular necrosis appeared with early hemodialysis, we have maybe more or beyond 90% of survivors from that disease. So now I would like to go for the last point that we, we say postpartum care. At the beginning, I was telling you that three goals to achieve is not the way. We have to say we have four goals to achieve. Control the DP prevent the fits, deliver the moda, but also the postpartum recovery of the preeclamptic patients. We can send the moda to home when the BP is stable and no urine protein. It is important. Let me, let me share with you that I have been talking with Dr. Wasgua for many times that we are not happy to handle preeclamptic patients at the community in our experience, in our view, all preeclamptic patients, despite of the severity of the disease, has to be handled at the hospital. So it's up to you. If you want to handle preeclamptic patients at the community, I will respect, but the patient is not safe. If the patient is not safe, a preeclamptic mother, Dr. Liban told you, is a patient with a multisystemic endothelitis. So could be a mild preeclampsia at 10 a.m. and could be a severe preeclampsia at 4 p.m. So be careful with that. Hypertension usually solves the issue when we deliver the baby. However, we did one year ago one prospective core study in Cuba between 2017 and 2020 that was to achieve my second PhD. And we follow with there 200, beyond 200 preeclamptic patients, pure preeclamptic patients for the last three years. And we got the surprise that the incidence of persistent hypertension could reach 27% of the sample. So what I am telling you and what I am calling your attention in this specific issue is don't think that when you terminate the pregnant, the issue has over. 27% in our series of cases persistent after 42 days with high BP, despite that the pregnant was terminated. So it is telling you that to recover the patient postpartum is also a goal to achieve. So from the multi the multivariate analysis. And we did through the cost regression, uh, cost regression, we developed two calculators, two calculators using the hazard ratio of the variable, so that could be a very important tool to predict what moda could persist with, pers with, pers with hypertension postpartum. And even I could say that has more than 90% of sensibility to say what moda with preeclampsia will continue as a chronic hypertension patient forever. So we are going to show you the two calculators that we are going to publish online very soon that could be useful for everyone who want to predict after terminating a pregnant and a preeclampsia patient, the probability of persists with hypertension is part of it. So, we have here, let's share. Uh -huh. Let's open the first one. So, 
Is open. Is open. Is there? So we have here, for example, it is it is the way. Is here already? Press. Is not there yet? Not yet. Sorry, sorry. Give me one minute, please. Sorry for that delay. Eh? It's okay. It's okay, Prof. It's okay, but it's very useful that I would like to share with you. Eh? Now let me see if you, you are able to see. It's there, of course. Yes. Yes, so we prefer two calculators of a, a result of the, of, the, of the research. One we use in a normal environment and another one for low resources setting. So I'm going to show you the both things, why the first one is more difficult to apply in Uganda is because the first one were use, was using the placenta findings. So what we did is as soon as the patient delivered, we picked the placenta and we did the histological study of the placenta to use some markets of a predictor of persistent hypertension. So the first calculator I want to tell you was using a placenta histological result. And the second one that we prepared is for low resources setting where you cannot Pick the placenta because we know it's very expensive procedure. So you can and it's a simple. You can and proceed and you go and say, click, check in the boss if the condition is present. So, no open yet. I think you should be first share the whole folder. Is there? Uh -huh. So you see here, you check in the box if the condition is present. For example, preeclampsia diagnosis before 34 weeks, proteinuria more than two grams in 24 hours per liter, bilus infarction, placenta dilution. In this point, let me tell you that for placenta dilution, we don't need the pathology. One obstetrician is able to recognize is the approach of placenta is there. So in that way, it could be useful. So you go, for example, and you say preeclampsia is present, proteinuria is present, and the placenta dilution is present. So you go ahead. It's not quiet. So, yeah. here, for example, is the utero pathology is at 24 weeks. The creatinine, for example, goes beyond 8 milligrams. The mother has more than 30 years. And we go ahead. It's very good. It's sharing good. And, for example, in the last view, we say that, for example, the mother has history of preeclampsia and develop intrauterine growth restriction. So from there, you make a diagnosis, and the diagnosis is there. They tell you that it's category three, and it's a high-risk patient to persist with hypertension in the postpartum period, and has more than 90% of probability to be a chronic hypertension patient forever. So in, 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 on the view of the time, you have seen the way to, 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 to work the calculator. We will share to Dr. Wazwa, to all the obstetricians in Uganda who would like to use the calculator to predict one that is using the placenta findings in the first 72 hours and one that is not using the placenta findings. So it will be useful. And you have a very important tool to say if the patient is a high risk patient for persistent hypertension, you know that we recommend it to be discharged the patient with antihypertensive drugs. For those patients with the category one low risk on category two in middle risk, we are not doing recommendation different to the currently recommendation. But those patients who are the calculator classified as a high risk has to be handled with differentiation and should be discharged with antihypertensive drugs. And we recommend it that should be assessed in 12 weeks postpartum 
to confound the possible diagnosis of chronic hypertension. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that elaborate uh, presentation on uh, management of preeclampsia. I noticed that pre the Professor has uh, talked of things that are done on the international scene and what we can do on, uh, on, uh, in Uganda. And uh, we should be able to pick up something that you can do in Uganda, like the need for, for the delivery. That cesarean section is not the immediate solution. Sometimes you do a cesarean section, the outcomes are not so good. The general delivery is probably the best. Uh, now, from Professor's discussion and presentation, it is clearly obvious that there are other game players that are required in the management of preeclampsia. Pre Dr. Rogers Kajabang is going to take us through the roles of the different providers in the management of preeclampsia. Dr. Kajabang is an obstetrician gynecologist in the Regional Referral Hospital, a homegrown son of ours. Dr. Kajabang. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Waswa, and uh, the team that has taken us through this very important uh, condition up to now. It has obviously come out that um, you need a team to manage a patient with preeclampsia. And it is best if um, the team is multidisciplinary, where you have an input from uh, the different cadres, but also uh, from uh, people who have specialized in uh, different aspects. Occasionally, the team is not at one facility. For example, you will have uh, a midwife who will manage, uh, who will receive a patient at a health center three and uh, probably be able to make the initial diagnosis and administer the loading dose of magnesium sulfate and then refer the patient to a tertiary hospital where more team members will be and uh, they will continue from there. Um, so let's go through the different uh, service providers and uh, the contribution they can make to managing our patients with preeclampsia. And we'll begin with uh, one of the most important cadres, the midwife uh, or nurse. And usually these have the very first contact with the patient, especially at the lower level facilities and um, they carry out the initial assessment and clinical diagnosis which is usually blood pressure and okay dr waswa we're not picking from your team Hello. I can hear you. All right. We had lost the presenter for a minute. I think now we should be back. Can I know where you lost me at? Dr. Radu, can we, can I know where you lost me at? You, you were finalizing the midwife and nurses. That was where you had left. Ah, yes. So in addition to the initial uh, treatment, um, the nurses also help us with the timely uh, administration of the maintenance uh, drugs and also the monitoring of the vital signs and documentation. So after the nurses, we have the laboratory team, uh, which will help with carrying out the necessary investigations. And they are quite a number and the laboratory team is usually equipped to carry out these tests. Uh, but also another role we, we have identified is them being able to train uh, the other cadres on how to carry out some of the simple tests. Uh, a nurse or even a doctor should not send a patient to the lab to do a urine protein. The lab people should come down uh, and, and teach us how to carry out uh, these 
these tests. Um, then uh, the laboratory team will also help with whenever a patient needs blood uh, transfusion um, and, the, and bleeding time and clotting time, a number of tests that um, can be done. Then we have the radiology team, which helps with the imaging, um, ultrasound scan as a basic minimum, but we also have Doppler ultrasound scan for the umbilical uh, artery, um, and then CT scan in some cases uh, where there are complications such as intraventricular um, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, we can also have uh, MRI and then interventional radiology in more advanced settings. The pharmacy is very important because as you have seen, there are a number of drugs that um, we need and the pharmacy should uh, at least uh, help to ensure that there's a continuous availability of these drugs, especially um, emergency drugs like magnesium sulfate and uh, high antihypertensives, injection, injectables, and, and even the uh, oral drugs. So pharmacy is really very important. And then we, we have the doctors. The doctors carry out uh, further patient assessment after the midwife and nurse, and then finally confirming the diagnosis and deciding on the management plan. So decisions like which drugs should be initiated, um, and then the delivery plan, which uh, Professor Yarin has been, uh, has explained very well, needs an input of um, the doctor. And I should mention again that uh, not as an individual, but again, as a team, the team should uh, decide, especially on the big decision of the timing of timing and mode of delivery. So we have a number of uh, cadres also among doctors. So the general practitioners who are our foot soldiers at the health center force uh, do most of the management there, terminating the pregnancy and then advising on the plan of care in terms of drugs and also um, timing and mode of delivery. And then at these tertiary facilities like ours, we have a number of cadres, a number of specialties, which if we can work together, uh, the outcome of our patients with preeclampsia uh, improves greatly. So the obstetrician as the primary um, team constitutes the primary, uh, the lead of the primary team. And then we have the pediatricians. Many times we have prematurity and uh, the pediatricians really come up to, to help us sustain those uh, premature neonates. And then we have the physicians, we call them in when there are medical, medical uh, complications, when you, you, you have renal failure, the nephrologist will come in, the cardiologist uh, will, will come in uh, when the heart is affected. The hematologist we have seen, um, hematological disorders are very common, especially thrombocytopenia. So the point is everyone has a different uh, role to play. And in the tertiary centers, we have the privilege of having all these specialties uh, in place and we should make use of them. We should make use of the neurosurgeon. For example, when uh, we suspect there is uh, intracranial hemorrhage, for example, when there's a neurological uh, deficit or intractable coma uh, after, after uh, seizures, we should evolve uh, the neurosurgeon. So let's make use of all the cadres. There is the anesthesia team, which um, helps us in theater and ICU and critical, critical care. Um, I hope you are still following, and I would like to conclude by saying that every team member should understand their role. What this helps is um, 
everyone will be able to make the contribution that they are supposed to make. And then the communication should be, should be effective. Um, verbally, uh, and in terms of documenting what has been done, if you're a midwife and you've administered the loading dose of magnesium sulfate from the health center three before referring the patient, uh, please document the referral form. That you have done that so that uh, we, we, we know when the patient comes to the higher center and, and that is not repeated. So documentation and communication is very important. We, we are working on improving the communication uh, between the lower centers and uh, uh, the, the tertiary centers in Western Uganda uh, regarding referral of patients. It helps to make a phone call to, uh, to the tertiary center when you're referring a patient you have witnessed fitting at your facility and, and probably just been able to administer initial and conversant. So communication cannot be overemphasized. And then finally, we recommend refresher trainings um, and simulation sessions among the teams, learning about preeclampsia and its management can never end. New information comes out all the time, and the teams on ground should uh, refresh, and, uh, get the new information, and see what to change um, in practice on a continuous basis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kajabwangu, for taking us through the different roles of the other health workers who are around. It is important that everybody in the hospital, in the unit, on the ward has a role to play. I see that there are some persons who miss out, persons who clean the cleaners. These people make the environment very nice and safe for us to, to work in. And these are persons that we should not, uh, should not uh, miss out. Ladies and gentlemen, preeclampsia is a disease which you need to keep improving and improving how you manage it. You may start performing poorly, but you must improve and improve and improve. And the Ministry of Health through is quite improvement project says, quite improvement is the way to go. In Mbarara Hospital and Mbarara University, we have used quite improvement tactics to improve our management of preeclampsia. Dr. Biam Kamonesmas is going to take us through how we can improve the management of preeclampsia using quality improvement? Dr. Biamukama, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Waswa, for that uh, introduction. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. Biamukama Monesmas, and I'm a third year resident, and I'll be sharing with you how we can use QI uh, to improve the management of preeclampsia eclampsia. Uh, here at our, in our setting at the referral hospital, receive approximately 30 cases uh, of uh, preeclampsia eclampsia every month and uh, like we've talked about we know that timely interventions are key in improving uh, the maternal outcomes so uh, dr henry Gobe told us that uh, preeclampsia eclampsia and hypertensive dis disorders in general are second leading cause of mortality in our setting and this uh, 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 made us look at it critically. And as the QI, we came up with some things that uh, we think can improve the management uh, of the condition. So we conducted a clinical records audit uh, 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 between March and July 2018. And it was basically about the management uh, of preeclampsia, eclampsia. So we retrieved files uh, for five months and uh, we retrieved a total of 188 <laughs> charts. And uh, when we looked at them critically, we found that uh, approximately 58.2 of the cases uh, were delivered by Cesarean section. And uh, also we looked at consultation with the specialist and we found out that only 35% of the charts had documented consultation or review by the specialist. 
Uh, it's also important for us to note that none of the files had a maternal complication noted, and yet we had had maternal complications uh, occurring. And the fetal complications, approximately 7% uh, had intrapartum stillbirths. We had antepartum stillbirth in about 13%. Early neonatal deaths in about 8%. Uh, admission to neonatal ICU in about 24%. And uh, we had about 20% of the babies being delivered with an APGA score of uh, less than seven at five minutes. It's also important to note that in about 46% uh, of these uh, had more than one of the fetal complications uh, that we talked about. Uh, regarding magnesium sulfate, uh, it was documented in about 70% uh, of the charts. And remember, we talked, Professor explained that magnesium sulfate is important in the control and prevention of the conversions. Uh, and if you can look at the graph, majority, or more than 50% of the cases never received a single dose of the maintenance dose of magnesium sulfate. And we can see that uh, those patients that received uh, about five doses were very few, less than 5% of them. The toxicity checks, uh, respiratory rate, uh, remember Professor talked about magnesium uh, sulfate toxicities, but we can see that respiratory rate uh, 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 was affected in almost 90%. It was never documented. Uh, urine output uh, uh, in about 90%, more than 90%, it was not documented. Uh, deep tendon reflexes, close to 100%. Uh, they were not uh, documented. And about the blood pressure, we can see uh, about 42% had blood pressure documented more than 10 times. But we can also see that in about 6% uh, of them, we had blood pressure documented once, probably at admission. Other things that uh, we found out, we carried out a knowledge assessment, uh, uh, and we found, and that was across all cadres from medical students, third year medical students, up to the specialists, and we found that there were some knowledge gaps in the management of preeclampsia, in the dosages of the drugs used, the drugs themselves, and the toxicities uh, with the magnesium sulfate, and uh, it was also clear that the senior residents and the specialists we are rarely uh, consulted. So the Quality Improvement Committee came up with some recommendations uh, about this. And one of them was to develop a simple management tool that everyone can use in our department, whether a midwife, whether a resident, uh, whether a medical student. So it was uh, to have a locally adopted guideline or protocol that you, we can use in the hospital simplified and uh, also a checklist uh, for us to be able to improve documentation and this checklist uh, help uh, clinicians during the management uh, of the of the of the patient so the checklist uh, is uh, what uh, is on the screen now and it basically has uh, some of the key things that uh, we needed to be documented like uh, calling for assistance uh, having a team lead in the management, having a specialist who is on duty informed, a urine dipstick, maternal vital signs uh, being taken, blood uh, sample being taken off for investigation, magnesium sulfate, both the loading dose and the maintenance doses being documented, uh, checking for the magnesium toxicities, uh, the antihypertensive drugs being given, monitoring of the fetal heart, and then discussing a delivery plan uh, with the patient and then uh, uh, debriefing the patient, the family, and the whole team uh, to be aware. And that is the management tool that we came up with. It basically captures the important things, the goals of management uh, that we talked about. Uh, it also uh, helps you to identify patients who have a preeclampsia with severe features. And the goals are clearly, uh, the management is clearly outlined uh, in, in, the, in the three goals. So if someone receives a patient and uh, uh, they, they, they have already, they are planning to admit the patient, then you know they follow up uh, the management tool on the best way to manage the patient. Then we also had uh, something uh, to 
remind clinicians on the dosages. So we, we develop a dosage, a drug dosage chart uh, where clinicians can check on the dosages, uh, the possible uh, uh, effects that can come uh, with the drugs and uh, uh, when they expect uh, the effects uh, to happen uh, with the drug. And then with uh, uh, continuous assessment on how we're doing with the, the, with the checklist and the protocol, we found that it is important for us to have a postnatal monitoring of these patients. So we came up with a postnatal monitoring tool and it also uh, captures uh, the, the magnesium sulfate maintenance doses, the toxicity checks, the maternal vital signs checked, uh, um, the urine dipstick, uh, the blood uh, results, the antihypertensive drug reviews, uh, consultation with the other important uh, 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 clinicians, and then a discharge plan uh, for this mother that can be dis uh, discussed at the end. I should note that uh, this uh, is uh, all in yellow color so that uh, clinicians can easily be able to identify patients that have preeclampsia. So the form is put into the patient's file and as uh, the ward rounds are going on, then someone can know that since there is a yellow form in this file, this is a patient who has a hypertensive disorder. Some of the improvements that we have noted, uh, we've noted uh, improvement in documentation, of the maternal vital signs, uh, the magnesium sulfate, uh, the toxicity checks. We've also noted there's an improvement uh, in the in the in the management. Basically, the knowledge we think has improved across all the cadres. Monitoring of the vital signs has greatly improved. And the frequency of magnesium sulfate administration, especially the maintenance dose that has been greatly affected, has improved. Then the toxicity checks uh, have also improved, and we are able to analyze to see if there is a reduction in morbidity and mortality. And some of the new developments, uh, like I said, was the postnatal follow-up uh, preeclampsia chart, and then also a preeclampsia eclampsia cupboard where we can have essential drugs uh, that are used in the management of the preeclampsia eclampsia. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for listening to us. Mwebale mnonga, mwebale nyo, foyo matek, yalama noi, uh, Mwevale Inno. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Biamukama, for taking us through an activity, a cure activity, which is required by all of us if uh, to improve the management of the different conditions of that we, might, we meet on the wards. Um, there are some questions that came up uh, during the presentations. We thought if we went into the discussions, it would take too long and we don't finish. But uh, thank you for being with us. We're about 280 participants online. And now there are some questions that came up and we'd like to ask you. Professor, could you come and read yeah. some of this? Um, there was an issue of uh, whether magnesium, whether nifedipine is safe in pregnancy and the uh, mm -hmm. use of magnesium sulfate and nifedipine together in a patient with preeclampsia. Yeah. Uh, Nifedipine is totally safe on pregnant and in breastfeeding, so we, could, we can use it without any problem. So it's very safe. Uh, when I was talking about the combination, it's safe to use. The problem is that has been reported some cases with pulmonary edema associated and the prolonged use of the Nifedipine and the magnesium sulfate. However, many meta-analyses has demonstrate that you could use both in case that it's not hydralazine, it's not labetalol, you can use nifedipine and it's mandatory to use magnesium sulfate. So what we say be careful is in cases specifically, for example, because it's not only in preeclampsia when we use magnesium sulfate and nifedipine. Don't forget that we treat premature uh, labor also using similar drugs like this. So what we recommended is that the patient has to be at the hospital. Don't use magnesium sulfate and nifedipine in one health center or something like that. We recommend it to be used in the hospital. So it's going to be more safe. But it's totally safe, the use of nifedipine during pregnancy. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Mm. Um, uh, could you have uh, something to talk about criteria for discharge? What we were talking, and the slide was clear, 
that the patient has to be discharged when the BP is stable and is not protein in urine. But what we are recommended to discharge a preclanted patients is that we have to be sure that she has recovery any damage that could happen in any organs. For example, if the patient has transaminas elevated together with the preclansia as a liver complication, it's not allowed to discharge the patient until we are sure that the patient has recovery properly, the liver function or the renal functions. But for the majority of the cases, we say the patient will be discharged when the parameters, as usually we uh, do for the following of the patient are normal, the BP are st is stable, and the patient is at no risk to get any cardiovascular or renal or cerebral complication at the community. And we are recommended, it's coming the recommendation very close, it's coming from myself, but you, you will see the result. We are recommended to use the predictor calculator to discharge patients with severe preclampsia. It's going to be a very useful tool for all of you to, uh, to identify in time what patient has to be discharged with antihypertensive despite that the patient has the normal parameters at the moment of the discharge. So it is important also. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. That is a guide on how to discharge a patient. Parameters you are supposed to look at, you know, the, how the symptoms disappear, the laboratory yeah. investigation, have all those things have yeah. been covered properly. Uh, Professor, um, one of the things that we talked about was uh, when to discharge, when to do a stent section out deliver. We'd like to ask Dr. Mark Rogove to come and talk to us about the mode of delivery of a mother with a preeclampsia. Should we consider caesarean section, Dr. Rogove? Thank you, Dr. Wasa. I think from our discussion, we. Discussion: We agree that vaginal delivery is the safest um, mode of delivery. So, one of the considerations is that if a mother has a known indication for C-section, you will have to do the C-section. But the other is that in patients with eclampsia, uh, remote from delivery, for example, six to eight hours, if you're going to start your induction, and it's going to take you beyond the eight hours, you might want to terminate that uh, pregnancy uh, by C-section. So you've also had on your words mothers on induction and probably they fit along the way. You're not going to keep uh, them there with the convulsions going on. So there are individual patient um, characteristics that will inform, but what we want to take home from here, even in our study, the mode of delivery, the commonest was C-section. What we want to take home is that not every mother with preeclampsia equals C-section. That is what we have to keep in mind. Thank you, Dr. Wasu. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rugove. The important takeaway from here is that there is no set rules. Each patient is handled as an individual and decision to made. Um, <laughs> There's something that Professor talked about, the role of pre or aspirin in preeclampsia. Professor, could you tell us to get through the role of aspirin in preeclampsia? Yeah, you see, it's important because for the last maybe 20 years, they have insisted in the use of aspirin, specifically 65 milligrams, for the prophylaxis of preeclampsia. Yes, in, in the majority of the study has been working, but we have to understand that the patient who has any genetic predisposition or any immunology predisposition to develop preeclampsia, despite of the use of the calician or aspirin, the patient is going to develop preeclampsia. Why I insist in this? Because is the aspirin is the solution for preeclampsia and the prophylaxis of preeclampsia. We have been using aspirin to the prophylaxis of preeclampsia for the last 20 years. Is that is the solution? We don't see preeclampsia currently. And you have seen that preeclampsia is still there at the same prevalent, or maybe in the West Africa, even a little increase of the prevalence between 5 or 10% of the cases. What is true is that when we introduce in high-risk cases 
for preeclampsia de aspirin, the risk of complication like intrauterine growth restriction, abruzzo of placenta or eclampsia could be reducing. But the truth is, because you are using aspirin, preeclampsia will not disappear. We have been using aspirin and preeclampsia is there. So the aspirin is very useful as a tool to reduce complication. But we have been using from 16 weeks or even 14 weeks, and patient has preeclampsia. So it's important tools, but it's not the total solution for the prevention of preeclampsia. Some factors are very, very, very important. And when the patient is going to develop preeclampsia, despite you are using calcium, aspirin, or you are using anything, the patient will, will have preeclampsia. It is what we have in our experience. Uh, thank you very much. Uh Professor, for that uh, explanation, if we know that aspirin will reduce complications, so you can use it. Um, thank you very much for listening to us and uh, for those questions. I would like to ask Dr. Elano to take over now and pick up persons who have questions or comments who want to be heard online. Dr. Elano. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Waswa and the team for the elaborate learning opportunity that uh, you have really availed us with. I am sure that people who have come here have not, uh, are not going to go back the same. They are going to share this information. And for us, the team from the Secretariat, uh, we, we will share these slides with every person who joined uh, using the registration link and shared with us their emails. There were people who raised their hands and uh, I, I, I tried to follow up if they had any questions, but they never really sent the questions. One of them was Nonori Emmanuel. I don't know if his question was answered along the presentation, but maybe this could be the time for him to raise up his hand and, and say one or two things. The other was Dr. Ayaro. I think it was Dr. Ayaro. Dr. Yaro, please go ahead with your question or comment. Or if there's any other person who has a question, you could maybe raise your hands. Uh, we have about three, uh, about, uh, about 10 minutes to the end of the session. So uh, we could, the session is open. Kindly raise up your hand and then, yes, I see three raised hands. Let me just start with uh, Dr. Uh, there's Theo Nesta. Has yes. Please go ahead with your question and comment. Be brief so that uh, we can. Theonista, uh, let me ask you to unmute. Go ahead with your question. If there is none, then we uh, can have. From... Yes, yes, yes. Loud and clear. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Okay, thank you so much for the very good presentation. It's so inspiring. Uh, I had a presentation. My, my, my question is about uh, the initiation of antihypertensives. Eh? So if right. the antihypertensives are more beneficial to, to the mother uh, to prevent complication like a stroke and what. But uh, in some settings, they do start antihypertensives, especially when the the blood pressure, the systolic is more than 155 and the diastolic more than 105 to do not decrease the MAP uh, and prevent the further uh, uh, hyperfusion of, of fetal placental unity. So I would like to advise us to tell us when to start antihypertensives at what uh, blood pressure. Blood pressure. All right. So I think uh, the team can jot that down. We can have one from Proskovia Uma, just quick to the point, and then Agira, uh, Drake, and then Dr. Castro will also give us his question or comment. Please go ahead, Proskovia. Proskovia Uma. Yes. Uh, I have a question that uh, what about if a mother gets high blood pressure? but she has no danger signs like headache, hypergastric pain, but she has proteins. And because we go, go to a scenario, a mother after delivery, she had high blood pressure. We try to give her the Philippine, Sablingo, even Methrodopa, but still the BP still continued, but she didn't have Odima. 
well, I got a dilemma. Right. In Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Auma Adira, please go ahead with your question or comment. Thank, thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Matt, for this. My question is, we've had cases of severe temperature in mothers who have had new partners. So what is the relationship about that? All right. I think uh, Dr. Ones must try to answer that, but we'll, we'll see if a team can have one question. Dr. Castro, please go ahead with your comments. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question and then a comment. The, co the question is, um, please kindly First comment. comment. First the comment. First the comment. The, okay, thank you very much for the team at Mara. <laughs> okay. The comment one is about aspirin and prevention of, a, of, a, of a preeclampsia. There was a big study um, done in, I think, in the UK, where the, it's the ASPRE trial, those who can look it up, ASPRE, A-S-P-R-E, and it was uh, giving aspirin. In fact, they gave a higher dose of aspirin, 150 milligrams. And they started between 11 to 13 weeks. And there was an 80% reduction in those who developed preeclampsia amongst those who had previous early onset preeclampsia, which is before 34 weeks. Um, so there is still a big role for aspirin. In fact, some people give bigger doses of 150 milligrams. Um, I can, some people can get to me if they, I can get them the study. It's in the New England yeah. Journal of Med Medicine. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Castro. And uh, can we have one? The question, was the question there, Dr. Castro? There was a question, but they wanted me to give the comment first. <laughs> All right, you can go ahead with the question. Yes, the question is about postpartum uh, medication for preeclampsia. Many times people drop the ball after we, after we, women have delivered. And then, you know, after they've they delivered, uh, whatever drugs they go on is what they go on. One of the biggest challenges we've had is with uh, methyl dopa and the issue of uh, postpartum depression. Because many women are, are, are at risk for postpartum depression after delivery anyway. Uh, and continued use of methyl dopa has shown that risk to increase. And many times we ask people to change drugs from methyl dopa to another drug, usually labetalol, nifedipine, and the other drugs, the enalaprils, and all can be now reintroduced. Um, so what is their comment on postpartum treatment of preeclampsia right. to reduce blood pressure? And many times women also do not know that they have to take these drugs for extended periods, maybe three, four, six weeks. They usually, many times the intern SHOs rates um, discharge treatment for one week and they discharge, you know, and many times some women need a longer time to remain on treatment. Um, what is your comment on that? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Twino Wesley, Henry Lukabwe, and uh, Mutesasera Sharon, brief question and comment. We have about five minutes. I would maybe request the, t uh, the participants to give us maybe five more minutes after to, to conclude the session. All right, Twino? Twino? All right, if Twino is not uh, asking, can we have from Henry? Yeah, thank you very much, this is Dr. Henry. Question briefly is about literature read concerning Tivotin aspartate in use of patients with preeclampsia. What's your comment on that? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Henry. Um, Sharon, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank Sharon. you very much, this is uh, Dr. Ope Jimmy, but uh, I'm using <laughs> yes, this is Dr. Peggy, but I'm using sounds uh, uh, this oh. network. It's okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to find out on the, there's been a new ACCA or a -A 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 AHA, that is American Heart Association, which have uh, uh, been able to uh, adopt uh, a new blood pressure uh, of uh, systolic 130. And the systolic uh, 80 millimeter mercury to diagnose patient with uh, with hypertensive disorder in pregnancy. What would be the comment on this new blood pressure cutoff, so that uh, it can help us to identify the risk, uh, high risk mothers, and then we reduce mortality finally. What would be the All comment right. on this? Oh, and okay. then the Thank second you. question uh, is, uh, yes. the second question is how. The second question how? is how would we manage patients who COVID-19 patients, and they also have uh, <laughs> preeclampsia. Uh, since some literature has shown that uh, some of these COVID-19 
causes here. Patient may have okay. complication that mimic complication of okay. preeclampsia. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we can Thank have you. final comments from Arik Mawien and uh, Albert Rechimara. Rich then we will have uh, the team respond to some of those questions. Uh, in the meantime, I can ask maybe Dr. Mark to unshare the screen. There is just one slide. And I'm also going to share a poll that members are going to, uh, to answer uh, as, as the team is, is, yeah, sure. All right, so uh, Dr. Wasu, back to you. I mean, uh, uh, Rick Mawien and Albert Rechimara. Those are the last questions, yeah. Uh, Rick, um, okay, we don't have a Rick. Can we have uh, the uh, Albert? Albert, go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm Albert. I'm here in Ikabare. I was wondering, uh, other than uh, or not, not limited this disease management, what other social strategies are there in in preventing this same disease? All right, thank you very thank much. You. All right, uh, so back to the team. Let's Look. just let's answer the questions. Uh, yes. High blood pressure, no signs of proteinuria. Yes. From 2013, the American College of Obstetry and Gynecology with the European Task for the Control of Hypertension have said that we can make a diagnosis of preeclampsia in ausen of proteinuria, and I think the criteria is clear. We have four criteria there. That is the pulmonary edema, the, the cerebral, the neurological manifestation, the platelet is less than 100, the W of the normal value, or the creatinine beyond 1.2. So we have cleared those four criteria. What we have is that the severity of preeclampsia is in, in, in the practice, you see, it's more common to see when the proteinuria is present because the proteinuria is expression of the, of the vasculitis, the, the systemic vasculitis the patient has. So it's affecting all the organs and also the kidney. So in our that comments that or question that what we recommend is in preeclampsia without proteinuria, the recommendation is the patient has to be treated depending on the severity of the disease. And we have all the drug in the breastfeeding period are safe to treat preeclampsia. So it doesn't matter if the patient has proteinuria or absence of proteinuria to handle the patient with nifedipine, atenolol, hydralazine, labetalol, everything you have in your hands. Remember the slide that I say from 450 meta-analysis, not antipertensis is superior to others. You need to have experience using it and you have to see the effectivity of the antipertensis each patient because for one person, or one patient could be very effective than ifedipine, but for another one could be very effective, the atenolol until 150 milligram. To put you one example, is what we know about that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor. The, the other question from Dr. P was uh, the cut of blood pressures uh, for diagnosing preeclampsia. Uh, what should we do? Should we continue with the Ugandan or should we change to that of America? What we recommend is, until today, we have done in Uganda the diagnosis of preeclampsia using 140 over 90, and it is the experience we have. I think we need more data. One, you see, you cannot say in one, for one study that you change the value of considered DP for preeclampsia for one study. Data is necessary and should be available for everyone to recognize that we have to move for 140 over 90, the criteria. Uh. Uh, this is Dr. Trino from Mengo Hospital. I wanted to ask about the video. Uh, Professor, um, uh, uh, was there a question of when, at what level should you, of hypertensive, should you start antihypertensives? Uh -huh. That, the question has to be clear. Depending on the patients, you see, to say one standard, let me say, in preeclampsia, preeclampsia is one disease that the clinical manifestation is not always the same. So we insist that for one patient that 140 over 100 asymptomatic, maybe you can say it, we don't need to use antipertensive for control and we can put in diet or something like that. But for a patient even with 140 over 100 with amaurosis or epigastric pain or even some signs of 
tachycardia or cardiovascular descompensation that could happen even with that BP, we have to treat the patient. So the standard to say and the goal to say is that we are going to introduce the antipertensive drug depend on the clinical manifestation of the patients. And we have to consider each patient as, as a, a, a patient to take in consideration. We cannot say we have to introduce with hundred of diastole because with hundred of diastole could be someone totally asymptomatic without risk and maybe you need to introduce. And maybe with 95 of diastole, in presence of cardiovascular symptoms or neurological symptoms or gastric pain, we have to use antipertensive. So we recommend it to assess individually the way to introduce the drugs. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there was a question about uh, the explanation of why new partners are high risk for, for preeclampsia. Yes, Dr. Biamkama. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we all know that uh, change in paternity increases the risk of one to develop preeclampsia, eclampsia. And it's basically because uh, we know that preeclampsia, you have the maternal, uh, the, or the mother reacting to the paternal uh, genetic material. And with frequent exposure of the same paternity or the same paternal genetic material, the risk of having preeclampsia in this mother reduces. However, if there is change in paternity, the paternal genetic material will also have changed. And therefore, even if someone is a mild virus, she will be exposed to a new uh, paternal antigen and, and no genetic material, and she will be like uh, uh, an early virus in this case. And that's why she gets an increased risk uh, of preeclampsia, eclampsia. Yeah, thank you. That's what I can say on that. Um, Dr. Henry Rukawe, please uh, forward to us the link of this uh, paper that you mentioned so that we can take a look at it. I, for one, have not had a look at it. Over to you, Dr. Ladu, for you know, more questions. All right. Yes. So I, I think our time is fast spent. We, we really try as much as possible to keep this between two to four. And so I would really apologize for the, the three hands that uh, were not able to raise the questions or comments. However, the discussion does not stop here. Uh, we, we, we hope that we're able to interact with the, the rest of it. Our emails are open. You can always uh, ask us the questions and, uh, and then we'll be able to forward to the right, the right people and then get back the feedback. Uh, before I conclude, there is a, a poll that is ongoing. I kindly recommend that each of us uh, takes uh, about five minutes of the time to to answer those few questions. We just want to check if this has been a productive session, if we can do better so that we bring this learning and make it much more enjoyable. And uh, then the, 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 the emails that you registered with, we are going to send this uh, the PowerPoints that have been shared together with the materials that have been shared. I see Dr. Castro has shared an article as well. We'll be able to forward it. But uh, we also have a, a, a YouTube channel that has most of these recordings, actually. It, it, we, we, ever since we started the webinars in uh, around September of 2020, we have most of the recordings of, 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 this, of the Self Motherhood uh, webinars that have been happening. So feel free to, to, che to, to, to check out the, the YouTube channels but also the materials will be coming together with the recordings will be coming to respective emails. So uh, with those very many remarks, I think uh, I just want to introduce that we have a team. Dr. Richard, are you on? Dr. Richard? Yes, I am. Yes, Dr. Dr. Richard is, uh, is one of the, the, the team members in the secretariat. I don't know if he has one or two announcements to make. And then uh, we can conclude with the poll and then we should be able to, to call it a day. Dr. Richard, go ahead. Yes, my comments uh, to thank you members. Thank you so much for our team for bringing such a very lively and informative webinar. I'll just like to highlight the next webinar will be again uh, next month of June. We normally take off the last Thursday of the month. So it will be uh, 20, 24th of June. And the webinar will be around uh, sickle cell disease and pregnancy and postpartum period. Of late, there's been an increase in cases of uh, 
women who are delivering or laboring, uh, who have sickle cell disease. So the team from Busitema University will be taking us through this webinar in the next session. So please look out for the emails and remember to register early and be part of the webinars. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Richard. And just to re-echo our, our gratitude to the Mbarara team, you have really, everyone is appreciating and we are so grateful. We hope that uh, the next uh, teams to present will learn <laughs> one or two things and, and perhaps make this learning better. Uh, whichever region you are in, we, we've, we've got participants from Marua, uh, we've got participants from Somalia, I'm sure from most of the far ends, I think we had some nurses join us from Aromo Health Center 3. And I think that is really what we look forward to, to have a, a very inclusive participation of all health workers, not really obstetricians and gynecologists, but it should cut across because as, as we've seen, that management is just not, like Professor said, it's a team effort and we shouldn't neglect that. The, the image that I shared here, uh, I participated, uh, I think, during my internship. Uh, I was in Lira Regional Referral Hospital, and uh, and a midwife referred to us a patient. Uh, and she, in a referral note, that was a referral note, she had recorded her BPs of 120 over 80. And uh, she had uh, she was stating that, really, she's not sure whether this is a clumps here or this is an evil spirit. And so she had referred the mother for further management. As you can see, it can be puzzling. This is not a very straightforward thing. So continuous learning and relearning and unlearning the, the old habits before we used to keep these mothers in dark places. But like, I think from the entire presentation, you've not had someone say, keep these mothers in the dark rooms and all that. So there is new information that is coming. And we hope that the entire team uh, and the health workers are willing to learn new information and share with, uh, with, with the rest of uh, the people. Again, thank you so much, the participants. May God bless you and keep you safe. And wear your masks uh, a social distance until we meet again a month from now. I think that will be from us. Thank you.